amen to that song. There's a song that'll get your blood going, so if I'm a little hyped this morning, you can blame it on Justin for picking that song before my, before my lesson. Um, if, you've, if you do look at the bulletin, um, you'll notice that this is not <laughs> the uh, lesson in the bulletin. I realize I designed this lesson to be really great for some of our young teens and young uh, kids and young families, and a lot of them over at Carnes this morning at leadership camp. So this morning I'm sitting there going, I can't preach this this morning, so I've changed up a little bit. Um, so we're going to be working on a series in a couple weeks, because I've got to get through what I was supposed to preach today. Apparently a lesson on forgiveness, right? We've been doing the Facebook. If you've been on Facebook, it's been a fun conversation back and forth. And then we're going to get into some series on parables. And uh, I had to first design this lesson for a Greenback Summer Series um, that I went and preached on and I just decided hey this would be a good you know good topic for us if you notice our switch is going bad so if the screen goes out don't worry open your bible and follow along you know Jesus was the greatest of storytellers was he not Jesus was the greatest of teachers we call him the teacher of teachers and so one of the things we want to do is to analyze the teachings of Jesus and the life of Jesus and one, as a preacher and teacher myself, try to figure out maybe some tricks uh, that Jesus has and some things that Jesus does that would help me to communicate his lesson, my lessons more effectively, like Jesus. Though nowhere clear, close, um, having that kind of wisdom. But when we talk about parables, and we think about the purpose of parables, sometimes I think we have somewhat of a skewed idea of what parables really were, okay? And now, obviously, they're illustrations, right? Obviously, he's comparing something to something that they can relate to, right? And that's what a good illustration does. You want to take something that, you know, we would use some more probably modern-day parables, um, getting away from a lot of the agriculture. I've worked farms in the summertime, but not, don't know a whole lot. So those, some of those farming illustrations can be lost on someone who didn't, you know, uh, raise seed and, you know, grow seed. And if you've ever been to our house, which we don't have one right now, you'll never see a whole lot of flowers uh, because we just, we kill them, right? So when Jesus says, put a seed in the ground and it will grow, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how to do that. And I'm not blaming my wife. It's our water, I'm telling you. It's the water we pray, it's just spray on it, and it just doesn't work. But... When you think about it, uh, there's some definitions that are usually given, you know, and the one that you hear the most is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning or something close to that, right? So what, what you're talking about is you want to talk about something spiritual, right? Something in the heavens, which usually while you're doing that is because it's something that Jesus is saying, you can understand this. So I'm going to give you an earthly message of something you can understand so that you can understand the spiritual. Okay, so that's one definition that's usually given. Sometimes people just say they're clever illustrations. Jesus would give a teaching, and then, you know, like a good preacher does, right, you got to start off with an introduction, you got to have a clever little poem, right, three points, an illustration, and then you close, right? And so Jesus, we're just following Jesus' three step hermeneutic process. And so we want to make clever illustrations. Merriam-Webster says this. It's usually a short, fictitious story that illustrates a moral attitude or religious principle. So Jesus is trying to get us to live a better life, a more moral life. And so what does he do? He wants to come up with a clever illustration to help you learn some kind of moral lesson. So... According to these usual definitions, that would mean that parables' purpose are to make a point that Jesus is making more clear, right? More clear and persuasive to get somebody to, who was not persuaded to either understand something Jesus said or to do something, to now be persuaded to do it because they've gotten this illustration and it's clicked with them they understood it, and therefore it has become clear. The spiritual message 
with this earthly you know, illustration, I can now understand the spiritual message. Does anyone know, you can probably already tell what my problem with that normal definition is. Why is it that after every single one of Jesus' parables, people walk away confused? If the purpose of parables is to take something that is already confusing, something that we could not understand, and to make it more clear, I mean, Jesus was not that good <laughs> at using parables. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 13. Ignore the screens. I know they're going to go in and out. Um, that's okay. I don't need them anyway. Though I wasn't going to use a PowerPoint this morning, and when I told my family I wasn't going to use a PowerPoint, I thought we were going to have some mental breakdowns because they like to take notes. So we'll go to Matthew 13. We'll start in verse 10. This is after the parable of the, of the soils, right? A seed, a, a person goes out, plants seed, it lands on four different types of soils, and uh, only one of them really makes it, right? Only one of them actually produces fruit. Well, after Jesus' cleverly illustrated, clear parable, the disciples, verse 10, came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered to them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So there's something we need to understand about parables. Jesus is telling them in a way and using them cleverly to get some people to understand and some people to not understand. So they're not just an illustration. Well, we've got to make sure the third graders can understand it, right? So that everybody can understand it. These are parables that are told so that at least one of the purposes here is that the secrets of the kingdom of God will only be revealed to those who are in the know, who have been given the secret. So I think that's interesting. So the, the disciples should get it then, right? The disciples, because they've been given the secrets of the kingdom, they understand the parable. Well, look at verse 13. Or verse 12. For to the one who has more will be given. He will have an abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Now, here's an interesting aspect about this. So Jesus is not just saying that he's trying to purposely be confusing, is he? He's not purposely trying to trip people up. However, people, whatever people do with the parables is going to be dependent on whom? It's going to be dependent on them. And so, and he quotes from Isaiah, which remember when Isaiah, after he sees the throne room of God, and he has the coal come and purified his lips, and the Lord said, who am I going to send Right? And Isaiah does the, here am I, send me. And immediately afterwards, what does, Jesus, or what does God tell Isaiah? You will go preach. They will not listen. They will not understand. You can be clear as a bell, which if you've read Isaiah, uh, it, it, uh, it can be clear, but it can also not be so clear. Um, but they're not going to hear. They're not going to listen. So a part of the confusion, I don't want to just say that Jesus is telling parables to purposely trip people up, but could he have told a story? Could he have given the clever illustration where everybody, no matter the heart, could have at least understood his intent? I think he could have, right? And so he says, I speak to them in parables. My purpose for telling the parables is for those who have the secrets of the kingdom of heaven will be able to understand it. Well, I'm going to go to this actually first, and then we'll go back to this next slide. We've looked at this before. The Gospel of Mark kind of illustrates this. And one of the, I think, 
what the secret of the kingdom of God is, the missing piece in all of the pieces of the parables is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember in the Gospel of Mark, every time Jesus would perform a miracle or a healing or he'd cast out a demon, what did he tell them not to do? It's found in other Gospels, but it's prominent in Mark. Do not go tell. Do not go tell. Part of it is my time is not yet, right? So there was a timing issue. Well, what, what did Jesus come to announce what was the timing he was trying to avoid? What was the thing that they had been anticipating? The kingdom of God, was it not? And so there's something about the nature of the kingdom of God that when you don't have the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, you cannot understand, right? Even his own disciples, you think about Peter. Peter, even when Jesus is being humiliated and he has the crown of thorns being placed on his head, he's being beaten, and Peter is asked, three, hey, you were with Jesus. No, I wasn't. No, no, no. You, I can tell by your accent, you are a man who was with Jesus. I swear to you I was not with Jesus. He makes an oath. He swears on an oath that he had not been a follower and a disciple of Jesus. And so this is pre-cross. Now, Jesus, does Peter not have all the same parables that we're going to read and study? Does Peter not have all of the teachings? All right? And so even his own disciples, they have the right answers. They have the right answers but they still did not understand. Remember, in Mark chapter 8, Jesus asked the disciples the question, who do men say that I am? Some say Elijah, some say a prophet, some say even maybe John the Baptist. Jesus turns to his disciples and said, well, who do you say that I am? Peter's answer, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus goes, ding, ding. All right, Matthew gives us a little bit of a further explanation that on this rock, on this statement, Peter, I will build my kingdom. I will build my ecclesia. I will build my church. I will build my assembly of people that when they finally cannot just utter that statement, because even the demons believed, didn't they? What were the demons calling Jesus? They were calling him the Christ, the Son of God. Oh, Son of God, what do you have to do with us? They could utter that same sentence and yet not mean what me and you mean or not have the desire to follow the way that me and you have the desire to follow, okay? So it's not this mental, you know, because what is immediately, Jesus tells Peter, okay, go and tell nobody. But I thought we were announcing the kingdom of God. I thought we were announcing who you were. The kingdom is not yet. And so what we're going to see are a lot of Jesus' teachings, especially his parables, are designed so that those who understand Jesus, those who can understand his purpose, those who can understand his message and his life and what he came to do, when they plug that into the parables, when they plug Jesus in the nature of the kingdom into every single parable, all of a sudden they become more than just a good moral story. Jesus is wanting you, oh, go be a good neighbor. He's just wanting you to be kind to those around you. There's more to it. He is saying that you are a part of this new way. You are a part of this new kingdom. You have a new teacher. And the life that you are to live... And what you're learning from these parables and understanding comes from a deep-seated knowledge of Jesus, right? You think about some of the parables. Think about the treasure in the field, right? It's only a, this entire parable is one or two verses long. The parable is like a treasure that when a man found it, he went and bought what? He sold all that he had, and he went and bought the whole field to own what? The treasure. That's so confusing if you don't understand that Jesus is the treasure. If you don't understand that not just Jesus as a teacher is the treasure, because Peter understood that, right? Hey, you're the teacher. 
Even in John 6, remember when Jesus is giving hard teachings and people walk away from him. He turns to Peter and the disciples, will you go away also? Where else could we go? You have the words of eternal life. So they understood Jesus as teacher. But I think those three days of Jesus being in the ground teaches us a lot about what the disciples knew and what they didn't know. And I think it's best illustrated by the two men on the road to Emmaus. Right, there's two men who were there in Jerusalem because they believed Jesus was the one. They believed he was the Christ. They believed he was the Savior of Israel. Three days go by, and what do they do on the third day? They're going home. We're going back home. And Jesus appears to them, hidden and disguised, right? And he asked them, where are you going? What, what, what are you guys talking about? And they look at him confused, going, are, are you the only one in all of the world, right, who does not know what's been going on this day? What has happened? Do you not read the news, right? Have you not been on your Facebook, right, recently? All right? Um, all the social media accounts are blown up about Jesus, Okay. Right, and that's what it would be going on today. Imagine, right? It's kind of like during election time or something big, right? Something scandalous happens with the president or an ex-president or a vice president. Everybody knows about it. Why? It's everywhere. It's in your face. And this is what they're saying. It is in our face. Side note. You know, historically, when you start reading non-biblical historians who talk about the resurrection of Jesus, you realize nobody was discrediting Jesus as a real person. No one was discrediting that Jesus went to the cross. No one was even discrediting after they heard the testimonies that he was raised from the dead. You would, if you would think about it, you would hear a whole lot, you know, against this Jesus of Nazareth being raised from the dead. That's why all those theories had to come out. Well, maybe he didn't really die, right? Maybe the, the disciples hid him away. All right? There's all these other theories that have to be pushed because Jesus of Nazareth, according to every source, was in that grave. Right? He was in that grave, and nobody disputed it. Maybe 2,000 years later when we weren't there, but you go check the sources, even, even our non-Christian sources, he was there. Okay, back to the sermon. So Jesus is talking to these two men, and what does he do? Starting from the law and the prophets, he teaches that the Christ must suffer. And in every single gospel, what is he preparing his disciples and those around them for? The Christ must suffer. And when you think about the suffering servant theme from Genesis all the way to Revelation, it just, it breathes out of every single book. The fact that God himself is sacrificing or giving up or giving attention to somebody who deserves death, right? Who deserves death. And when you can truly understand that, you will begin to understand the nature of the kingdom. All right, so let's go back. What are parables all about? Go to Mark chapter 4. Turn the Bibles to Mark 4 with me. Now, this is the same... This is the same... Um, Conversation we just read in Matthew, but Mark's version. I kind of like the little bit lengthier of discussion. All right, Mark 4, verse 10. When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything else is in parables. So I find that interesting. It's almost as if it's almost as if Jesus is saying, when you hear a parable, if you know the secret, it's not even a parable to you. You don't even have to guess its meaning. You don't even have to guess its understanding. It's not confusing in any way, but people who don't have the secret, they're what? They see a parable and they're going, can you just, can you talk to us in plain message? All right? Can you please speak plainly for once? It's kind of like when people were trying to pressure Jesus to actually call himself God. And he's like, look around you. Do I really have to say it? Look at my teachings. 
Look at my miracles. Look at all the witnesses at my baptism, the transfiguration, right? Look at what I'm teaching. Look at where I live. Look at all these proofs. Do I really have to say it? And he says it in so many ways um, that if we would really understand like the I am statements, right? Him having the spirit of God, calling himself the son of God. You see, the Pharisees understood it. You, when he called himself the son of God, whoa, 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 let's stone that man to death. He has made himself what? Equal with God. And no man can be called God but God. And Jesus goes, you call people gods all the time. You've got it right back in the Psalms, sons of God. What's so problem with me taking the same title you've acknowledged of people throughout? I have, I'm a unique relationship as the son of God. But what's, what's the deal? They understood he was, he was elevating himself. All right, so verse 12. So that they indeed may see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you, not, do you understand these parables? How will you then understand all of the parables? I love that. There's something subtle in there, isn't there? Jesus is saying, if you can understand this parable, if I can get you to be able to work this parable out, guess what you're going to be able to understand about all of the parables? You'll have understanding of all of them. Why? Because if you plug the same secret, if you plug the same knowledge into this parable, all of a sudden, all the parables get unlocked the same exact way. So what are the parables about? He, called, he told us. It's the kingdom of God. We have to be careful, and this is what we're going to do when we're studying parables. Because if we just see them as clever illustrations we're going to miss a point. If we just see them as Jesus trying to teach some moral principle for you to be just some good person, we're going to miss the point. If you don't have the fundamental secret foundational knowledge that this parable is about the nature of the kingdom of God that Jesus came to build, establish, reign over, and that you have the opportunity to become a citizen of, you will just see this as a well, I, I guess he's just asking me a little, be a little better than I was before, right? He's asking me to kind of join this kingdom as if I would join, you know, something else that would benefit me, right? Um, you know, a lot of the parables he would go in, even with one with the treasure, right? That treasure, the reason why I want that treasure is because what can you do with treasure? You can take treasure and you can multiply it and then I'll get more out of this. And when in fact... You are going in, and you've already, right, all spiritual blessings are found in Christ Jesus. You are going in for the, ple the blessing, and if God decides to bless you further, you can. Remember the parable of the talents? There's a ten-talent guy, five-talent guy, one-talent guy. And I heard something interesting. Um, I can't remember where I heard it from on uh, one of the, a podcast I was listening to the other day, and they said something about the parables that I never really, I never really considered. You know, when Jesus is saying, hey, I, I gave the ten-talent man ten talents, he doesn't even say that he used all ten talents, but that he used what God gave him and tried to do what God asked him to do. Five-talent guy, he didn't necessarily use all five talents. He just took what God gave him and did the best that he could. And it goes to show, and that really makes the point, and the final guy that he talks to, he says, yes, you've only had one talent, but if you would have just done something with it, put it in the bank, and got even a little interest, you didn't even have to use it to its fullness, I would have blessed you back with it. And so that kind of gives us an understanding of the other talents as well, that God, this kingdom, is about you understanding and being transformed by Jesus and understanding the treasure that you have been given is not for you to keep to yourself. And you are to bless others, you are to use it, you are to be a, and we'll get into that, but the point of all that is, did any of them know, did the ten-talent man know that he was going to get ten talents back? We have no understanding. There's nothing in that parable that suggests that a guy, hey, I've got ten, and I know if I use ten, I'm going to get ten back. So it's a selfish ambition. Hey, the five guy, I've got five. But the one guy did know something. I know that you are an exacting God. And you did not give this to me for me to just sit around. I don't know what I was going to get back, but I at least didn't want to what? 
I at least didn't want to lose it. I at least didn't want to lose it. And so what we're understanding from that kingdom is, do you know what your reward will be? Did Job have any idea that God would restore his fortunes and his family threefold? Did he do it for his fortunes to be restored? Job didn't do it to try to gain something from God. And a lot of times we use God that way, don't we? When we pray, what are we trying to get out of God? What can I get out of you? Right? Hey, God, I, I was good this week, so what can you bless me with, right? That's not the way it works. Will God bless us? Yeah. Do we know how much? No. Do we know one day we'll have that eternal reward? Absolutely. But what are we learning about the nature of God? And that's what we're going to be exploring once I get into this. So, I want to turn one last passage. Go to Matthew, back to Matthew 13 for a second. And I want, to see, I want you to see something as you're studying parables. And this is in a section. Matthew 13 is in a section of parable after parable after parable after parable after parable. Okay? Look at verse 51 and 52. After all the section on parables, here's what Jesus has to say. Matthew 13, 51, and 52. Have you understood all these things? Parable of the net, parable of the weeds, right? Parable of the seed and the leaven, parable of the treasure, all the parables. Have you understood them all? They said to him, yes. So somewhere in this journey, through him teaching on parables, they went from, I don't know what you're talking about, to, I understand. Which, their level of understanding when they say yes may not be the level of understanding Jesus is requiring, but here's what Jesus' response is. And he said to them, and I think this is really for us, this is going to be for us and anyone who comes to these parables. Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Now, what does he mean by new and old? I'm going to tell you what I think. And I don't necessarily, you know, you don't want to always associate Old with Old Testament, New with New Testament. But I do think he's talking about Old and New in the sense of all the stories you've ever heard about God in his relationship with his kingdom, like with Israel, and all that Jesus' new teachings that he has brought, when you put them together, and you've been trained for the secrets of kingdom of God, you will, what does he say? I lost what he said, lost my head. He says... Um, you will be able to bring out like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and old. Now, here's one of the cool things. Go back to Matthew 13, verse 35. After he's talking about these parables, he said nothing to them without a parable, right? Verse 34. He says, this was to fulfill what, the, what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. What is the one thing that even the angels and the prophets, even when they spoke, didn't understand but looked into, wanted to look into? The nature of the kingdom, wasn't it? How God was going to redeem all mankind. Jesus hid it in the parables. The parables are about how God is going to save the world. It's going to say something about those who seek, those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, right? And how God is looking to bless those who are hungering and thir thirsting for righteousness. Turn your Bible to Psalm 78. This is where it's quoted from. What he just quoted is Psalm 78. And, I want, and this is where we're going to end, I promise. Um, Psalm 78. Look what he quotes this psalmist. Give ear... This is verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, and I will utter dark sayings from old, things they have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. 
And so even the psalmist is saying, when he is speaking in parables, and when he understands, and when you understand, you are to do what? You are to share all of this message with not only your family, but from generation to generation in all the world, so that they may know the glorious deeds of God. If you walk away from the parables going, how glorious is man, and how glorious man can be, and how good we can be, I think you've missed the purpose of the parables. You need to walk away going, how good is our God? Every single parable is if the seed hadn't been planted in your heart, what, what good is soil, even a good-hearted soil, without the seed? Who's providing the seed? And I think we even go too far in this parable to say that we are the one who scatters. There is a place for that later, but in this parable, Jesus' words are what's being scattered. Jesus is the one who's scattering it. Jesus is right now telling them how you handle my words and my teachings. God is the one who provides all of the nutrition and the seed that can grow even in a good heart. Now keep reading. Look at verse 5. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that, here's one of my favorite parts, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Does that not sound a whole lot like what Jesus was saying in his parables. Those who hear, they will hear, and they will be blessed beyond all measure. Those who don't will just be like all their stubborn fathers before them who've rejected the message of God, the glories of God, and the workings of God, and what is their fate. So when we go through this parable studies, I want to try to find the same purpose and I want to bring out the same purpose that Jesus has said. If you can understand this parable, you'll be able to understand them all. And in Psalm 78, where he quoted, my favorite part is so that the people who get it will share his message with those who don't. And through their life, and through their faith, and through their love, they may be able to change hearts through the message that they preach. Because where is our hope found? Is it found in me? Is it found in you? Is it even found in all the members of the church throughout all the world, right? Even if all of us did exactly what God asked us to do, we can only do what? Plant and water. Who gives the increase? Without God, nothing is possible. But with him, nothing is impossible. This morning I set a challenge before you. When you're reading the parables, when you're reading Jesus' teachings, don't look for the obvious message always. Don't go so secret, right, that you're taking apart the parable and making every single thing, you know, a, a, a metaphor and an illustration, and you make this guy this and this guy. There's usually one point that Jesus has for every parable. And when you start tearing it apart and making it a thousand different points, you've really lost its message. And secondly, if you don't come away with a better understanding of the nature of God and his kingdom, you're missing something in it. Dig a little deeper. This morning, if you're not a Christian, you may go, I don't never even read a whole lot of Jesus' parables. I don't know what you're talking about with these parables. Really don't matter. Really doesn't matter. Ultimately, what they're trying to get you to understand and try to get you to know is to get to know Jesus, to know his work, to know where he comes from, to know his nature, and to know what he's provided for you. And what he's provided for you is a kingdom of safety, a kingdom that takes you out of the world. You're still in the world, but you're not of the world so that you can be different and set apart and that you can be changed by God himself when his spirit is inside of you. You may ask, how do I, how do I get that? 
First, we've got to talk about faith. Peter can utter the words, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus says, you're not ready. We're not just looking for you to answer a couple questions about Jesus. You really need to know in your heart who Jesus is, that he came as God in the flesh, died for your sin, and without him, you would have no hope. There's not even a little hope outside of Jesus. Well, maybe, but I've been really good. But you don't know what good is until you met Jesus. And then you realize how good you're not in comparison to him. And so if you've not had your sins washed away in baptism, right, to receive not only the forgiveness of sins, but also to receive the promise that he has been given every man who would, who would obey and have faith and to become his disciple, the gift of his spirit, which is our seal for eternal life. That can be yours today. And that's, I mean, if there's a gift l worth looking for, right? If there's a, you know, all these banks are trying to come up with new ways to sell mortgages right now because there's just no good way to sell a mortgage right now. I know I'm in the middle of it. Interest rates are too high. Banks aren't going to back behind a lot of their stuff, right? But they're coming up with all these, you know, trying to, oh, interest rates have, are they're this low. No, you're talking about like an eight-year interest, you know, eight-year mortgage that if you want to pay $7,000 a month to get, you can get a 3% interest, right? But they're trying all these different ways just to sell this much hope. Jesus has sent his only son to give you the only hope that matters. And he died for you because he loves you and he cares for you. And if you're a Christian this morning and you forgot that, that Jesus isn't just trying to get you to be a better person, you know, you were this good, now he wants to be this good, right? Then maybe a little bit later he wants to be this good, and maybe you just throw some more good things in. He's wanting to completely change who you are from the inside out, and that's exactly the message of the parables. You can't come to the kingdom being a little changed. You come to the kingdom being completely changed because of who Jesus is. If there's anything that you, ha you need this morning, we ask that you come forward as we stand together and as we sing.